Anyway, my name's Jeff. I used to sell boats. Now I write books. I'm happy to be here talking to you. I was part of a project at the University of New Hampshire for 10 years that uh, married scientists and historians. And it was sort of a forced marriage in some ways because we sort of approached the world differently. But the goal was to ask questions, and maybe even answer some questions, about Ocean's past that couldn't be answered by people who were just trained as historians or just trained as ecologists. But if we put our brains and training together, what might we do? So, so the book I wrote, I wrote by myself, but I couldn't have done it without having been part of this extraordinary team that in turn is part of a larger international team, the Census of Marine Life, for 10 years, trying to figure out things about oceans. Um, Afterwards, there'll be a book signing. Christmas is coming. It's right around the corner. If any of you want to buy a book, I will write in it, you know, to Fred, to whom I owe everything. Uh, okay. So, are the oceans dying? It's a preposterous thought. And yet, it's one that not so long ago would have seemed absolutely preposterous, and yet today, many of us think it's all too real, all too possible. And then we ask questions, who is in worse shape the fish or the fishermen? And then we ask, and how did we get into this mess? Sometimes it's easy, it's just easy. Our age, we look back and we say, you know, it's modern technology, it's, it's draggers. It's GPS navigation technology, fish finders, big polyester nets. They made a hell of a mess of things. And it's easy for us to imagine that the fix that we're in, and any of you who have even just been reading the newspaper in the last 30 years, much less really paying attention to fisheries, understand that we're in a, fish, in, a, in a mess. The New England fisheries have become the poster child for failure nationwide, and the fights between management and fishermen have been colossal. And there's been a lot of ill will. It's getting somewhat better now, but it's, it's a, been a pretty rough time. And over time, everybody's lost. The fishing community has been prostrate, and the fishing stocks themselves in the coastal marine ecosystem are in very tough shape right now. So it's like lose, lose, lose. How do we get into this? Sometimes it's easy to look back well beyond World War II, back to the 19th century, and imagine that in a different era, a simpler era like this one maybe, that Winslow Homer painted when he was down at Prout's Neck, um, things were much better. So this painting is 1885. Homer's down at Prout's Neck, and he called it the fog warning. And you can see his schooner, the fisherman's schooner out there, and the fog bank rolling in, and this dude is rowing and looking over his shoulder saying, I hope I get back before the fog comes. The painting has often been presented as sort of a timeless fishing scene, simple technology, classic fishing, pre-industrial. But as a historian, one of the things I do besides torturing students is, is I, try to, I try to pin down historically specific moments, times from the past when things were sort of of a piece right then. And what I would say to you is there's just nothing traditional about this painting at all. This is a, a a moment in time, not a timeless moment. What do I mean? Well, let's begin with the dory. People had been fishing these waters for 300 years, 300 years before they decided to leave the relative safety of their mother ship and go out in a stinking little dory. This is not the Sea of Galilee here. This is God's great Atlantic Ocean. So for 300 years, Men had faced enough danger standing around the rail of their ship and hand lining over that rail, and they were taking out 150,000, 200,000, 250,000, 300,000 metric tons of cod every year for 300 years. But by the middle of the 1800s, 1850s, catches are getting worse. It's harder to find fish. And one way that you compensate is you work more extensively, so you spread out more from the ship. So what do you do? Well. Let's get in these stinking little rowboats and saturate the area with more hooks, okay? So this is not timeless, it's lunacy. And it's brand new around the time of the American Civil War. Oh, and then what about the fish? Anybody recognize this boy? We got a halibut. Largest member of the flounder family, you know, really big ones, got six, 700 pounds. The halibut had been a trash fish for centuries. Captain John Smith was here. He said, who the hell would want to eat something like that? And then the colonists came. They said, ooh, we don't want these. And the commercial fishermen, they got nothing to do with halibut. There was no market for halibut. Nobody liked them. They would sometimes cut the fins off the way 
to do with sharks these days because the fins were goopy. They had this gelatinous stuff <laughs> people liked. There was no commercial fishery for halibut for centuries. 1830s, halibut get redefined, and they go from being trash fish to cash fish, just like in our lifetimes, monkfish. Anybody here had monkfish? So when we were kids, I got to tell you, guys would haul back, and there'd be monkfish on the deck, and they'd pitchfork them over the side. And by the time we got to be well into middle age, and the fisheries are going down the tube, those monkfish are being saved and served up at white tablecloth restaurants for a nice slice of money. Okay, from trash fish to cash fish. Same thing with the help. So the point here is, Homer painted this picture in the 1880s, and it's been regarded as a timeless fishing scene, but it's just one little snapshot, late 19th century, long line dory fishery. One little snapshot in centuries of changes in the fishery. As a historian who understood the fisheries were a mess and who had gone to see his young guy, I wanted to understand how had this happened. And I had a hunch a while back that maybe if I could reconstruct a story of what had happened in the pre-industrial era, it might illuminate a little bit where we are today. That's how this got started. It turned out I found an avalanche of material, much more than I had ever, ever imagined. Which is why the talk tonight is only three and a half hours long. <laughs> Uh, you know, I can't really have the time to start with the Vikings, but, but they're in the book. So if you buy the book, you get to see it. But I couldn't resist. It's such a great picture. This is a replica of Viking ship uh, in, in Iceland, and a colleague at U UCAL Berkeley helped me get the photo. But the point is, about 1,000 years ago, there's a revolution in Western Europe. The Vikings bring new technology to allow Europeans to, to eat, catch and eat sea fish. Up until that time, Europeans ate freshwater fish, perch, trout, carp. I heard you little carp issues. <laughs> and going out to sea is dangerous, and it requires expensive gear. So if you have freshwater fish or you have anadromous fish like sturgeon and salmon that swim up the river right to you, that's good. About 1,000 AD, after the Vikings got in Western Europe, we know different ways people start turning to, to fish. But I can't do that right now. It's a sea fish. So here's the takeaway message before we get going. If, if you don't have time, you need to leave right now. This is it, OK? As the historian, I say to you, that my pitch is that without genuinely historical perspectives on changes in the sea, we have no idea of the magnitude of the restoration challenges we face. In other words, if you look back and you think that 1992 is the baseline, or that 1976 is the baseline, or you know, pick a number sometime in our lifetime, you're missing the perspective of time of several centuries in what some of us are now calling the Anthropocene, the geological epoch in which we currently live, in which the universe is being affected by human activity. But uh, these historical changes are crucial, and that's what my book is about. It is, a, it is a good piece, I think, of historical marine ecology or marine environmental history that actually has sea serpents in it. Ooh, ooh. Now, I actually am not convinced there are sea serpents out there, but in the early 19th century, some of the best and the brightest thought there were. So I gave them their say. They get a little space in there. One illustration, too, from MIT. Um, the point is, I'm trying to reconstruct the past on its own terms, OK? All right, so let's get started. Here we are, the great coast of Maine. You guys recognize this. We got Cape Ann. Uh, down here, the uh, Merrimack River, the Piscataqua, where I live with the town of Newburyport, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and all the way up past Casco Bay here to the Kennebec, okay? So that's our coast with uh, the Isles of Shoals down here. Before the American story was cowboys and Indians, it was fishermen and Indians. And what we have here, just imagine, start shivering, this is the Little Ice Age. European seamen are showing up on the coast of Maine, the tail end or the middle of the Little Ice Age, 1580s, 1590s, 1600s, okay? And what do they find? This coastal ecosystem that we think we know was totally different. From Portland, Maine, down to eastern Connecticut, there is a savanna, a prairie on the coast. It's not dark forest right down to the shore. There's tall prairie grass like what you would find in Illinois, the home of the now extinct heath hen. This ecosystem had been nurtured by Abenaki people who had burned out the forest. And then the forest itself, on the uplands, on the uplands, what you have is big trees. Chestnut, elm, oak, hickory, maple, all the hardwoods. Big trees in the uplands. 
And down in the, in the valleys, in the river bottom, the stream beds, you have white pine, massive white pine. And what the European said is, a man on a horse can ride full tilt through this hardwood forest. Massive canopy, forest canopy, big trees, spongy leaf litter and humus on the, on the water, on the floor of the forest, which filtered the rain and filtered the melting snowpack in the spring that provided cool, clear streams that provided perfect spawning grounds for salmon, shad, sturgeon, uh, lampreys, and the rest. So the system looked very different than anything we imagine right now. But when these Renaissance seamen, these little Ice Age ships, got here, what they found is all sorts of familiar stuff that they knew from home. It was salmon and harbor seals and eider ducks and codfish and sturgeon. It was all the same stuff they had at home. But there was a lot more of it here. They did not find queer things that Columbus found, oysters growing on trees. What kind of trees do oysters grow on? Mangroves. <laughs> mangroves. There's a man who's been in the tropics. <laughs> so oysters are growing on mangrove trees in the Caribbean, and Magellan's going out to the Philippines and seeing these giant uh, clams and chambered nautilus, all sorts of queer stuff that nobody ever saw in the English Channel. <laughs> but when these seamen from Brittany and the Basque region in England get here, it's all the same stuff, right? Well, here we are. All the but the abundances were much greater. The size of the individual organisms was much greater. And there was more what we would call year classes or different sizes of organisms. Okay? So it's like, oh, something's different about this. All right. So by 1720, when this image is made, this is Herman Mahl's depiction of the cod fishery in Newfoundland. Europeans were taking about 150,000 metric tons of cod out each year, hand lining from along the rail of their ships. You see they had these little barrels perched on the edge of the ship. They used to sit in the barrel and fish. Stand in the barrel and fish, try to keep yourself as dry as you can. But nobody's stupid enough to go off in a little rowboat. And, um, and they're sending fish home, and they're sending fish home to Europe. The coastal ecosystem was extraordinarily productive. The inshore waters were productive too. This house is about 100 yards from my house in Portsmouth. And McFedris wrote, he built the house in 1717, and he wrote to a guy in Ireland that year, the river is full of salmon, it might take 1,000 tons here. I don't actually think that's an accurate measurement. It was his way of, of conveying that the river ran silver every spring. Okay? And that river, the Piscataqua, goes up to the Salmon Falls River, which is where Abenaki people caught salmon at the falls. But these river fish are sitting ducks. Again, you don't need much technology to go get river fish. So what we have early on in this colonial period, 1750s here, the people living upon the banks of the Merrimack observed that several species of fish are not so plenty in their seasons as formerly. We're catching them too fast, too furiously. We have Judge Chadbourne in South Berwick, Maine. Formerly, large fish such as salmon, bass, and shad come up the river in plenty, but they have forsook it. Charming turn of phrase. <laughs> That's, uh, he didn't even mention sturgeon. He grew up about two miles from Sturgeon Creek. But he was born in the 1730s, and by the time he wrote this memoir in his 60s, he had never seen Sturgeon as a kid, because they were already gone by then. But what he saw during his lifetime was the salmon, the striped bass, and the shad disappear. And then Jeremy Belknap, a, a contemporary of his, note that the striped bass was hit hard in the Piscataqua, and the fishery was almost destroyed. So by the 1790s, we have some serious measurable kind of impacts on that inshore, not the offshore, but the inshore coastal ecosystem. So I make the case, my boy George Washington here with his wooden teeth. Um, by the inauguration of Washington, we could speak to what had been going on already. Localized depletion, no more sturgeon in the Piscataqua River. Range contractions, walrus is being pushed up to the Arctic. You guys all know that walrus lives in the Arctic, right? But did you know that they used to breed on islands off Nova Scotia? So when Europeans showed up, walrus were, the range was much farther south. There were many more organisms, many more animals. But by the time of Washington's presidency, their range and their numbers had shrunk. Extinctions. The Atlantic gray whale, near extinctions, the, near, the, the great auk, diminished estuarine productivity. My point is, 
talk about this all night, we've got some measurable impacts on coastal ecosystems by the time of Washington's presidency. Oh, here's one of the casualties, our North American penguin, the great auk. You know, 30 million years of evolution had changed these birds to become magnificent swimmers and plunge divers, or divers, not plunge divers, divers. They could um, uh, catch fish, capelin and sand lance and other fish, incubate their single egg. The two parents would take turns incubating this one egg. But to do all this, they'd given up their ability to fly. So they were the North American penguin, okay? And they used to be in vast, vast numbers right here. You go down to Harpswell back in the day, and you would see these massive migrations of these birds because they bred on rocky islands off Newfoundland, but then they would start to swim like this because they couldn't fly. And they would go all the way to Cape Cod or they would go all the way to Cape Hatteras and spend the winter and then they go back to Newfoundland to have their babies. The fact that they couldn't fly made it easy for fishermen to bop them on the head. Fishermen channel them into corrals, bop them on the head, render them for oil, use their flesh to bait cod hooks. 1839, a Marblehead fisherman concerned about the downturn in the mackerel fishery in the spring, concerned that they were taking mackerel in their spawning season, said, if we don't ease up the pressure on the mackerel, the penguins that were so numerous here at the time of the revolution will be gone. Five years later, last one was killed, deader than a doornail on the coast of Iceland. Species is extinct. So this was a casualty, but every bird species the, the seabird species in the North Atlantic, the puffins. Imagine wringing the neck of a cunning little puffin and putting its flesh on a big cod hook. The guillemots, the mures, the turs, the auks, the shearwaters, the petrels, the gannets, they all were used for bait and other aspects, uh, and their numbers were reduced dramatically. Okay, so that takes us up to, you know, the extinction for these guys comes in 1844. Um, so let's shift now. Let's go to about the middle of the 19th century, right before the Civil War. Here's George Donnell, basket of Pollock. Uh, he was from York, Maine. Fishermen like Donnell were not using the word sustainability, but they were asking questions of each other and their neighbors about whether there would be fish for the future. They were fishermen, and they were concerned that there would not be fish for the future. They were not using terms like ecology, but they were asking questions of each other about relationship of predator and prey, bait fish to the species they wanted to catch, how the system was functioning, because they were observing, this is 1850s, 1850s, not 1950s, 1850s. They were observing that the system wasn't functioning as it had before, and they were concerned. Now, the intensity of their complaints increased dramatically during the 1850s and 60s. So we can think of this as a turning point. And these are the first systematic concerns about sea fish. Not salmon and shad and sturgeon. Everybody knew you could whack those. But this is now concern about cod and mackerel and menhaden and herring. Holy smokes. What's going on? So the question that I'm going to structure the next part of the talk around is why. What changed perceptions and attitudes of fishermen uh, on the coast of Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Nova Scotia, 1850s and 60s? Okay. So we got this period now from a little before the Civil War to about World War I. And what do we see? Well, we see changes in the sea, more measurable, demonstrable changes in the sea. And we see a sea change in attitude about ocean resources. The fishermen themselves know we got a problem. And we got a period in which many fishermen themselves are seeking regulation, and I'll lay some of that out for us. And the other thing is, it's a period in which they're using technology that we wouldn't even call technology. I mean, that's a pinky schooner. They're handlining along the rail from that little 50-foot schooner Couple of guys with some hooks and lines out there, and we're saying, how the hell could they put a dent in anything? How could a couple of puny guys with some puny hooks on a puny little schooner like that amount to a hill of beans? Stay tuned. Okay. So there's this fisheries revolution in the Gulf of Maine, this period. 
driven in part by modernization, which I'll explain in a little bit. Not industrialization, not mechanization, but still modernization. It affects fishermen's understanding and ecological consequences. Now, can anybody read the sign there? This is the St. George River, Warren, Maine, fishing for alewives. No, dump your rubbish over the dam. You would say, don't pour your rubbish over the dam. They would say, dump your rubbish over the dam. It's a little different. <laughs> this is one of my friend Bill Leavenworth's postcards. He's got a great postcard collection. What we see here is the guys on the, um, on the stage uh, catching uh, uh, fish, alewives probably. We've got a little fish ladder here, so some of them can uh, supposedly go up to spawn, but lots are being con uh, caught. But meanwhile, we're dumping our rubbish right into the harbor. That was the norm. I love that postcard. <laughs> Times change. OK, let's look at some of these changes in the fishery. Even though it's sails and oars and hooks and lines, we still got some serious changes that are ramping up pressure on fish stocks. Number one, nets get a lot bigger. The very same technology down to Haverhill or Lowell or Manchester that can now make cloth and thread and twine with machines can be used to make fish nets. Up until the 1840s, all the nets are made by hand. Every single mesh, every single mesh is made by hand. But by the 1860s, you got factories making nets with machines, making nets as big as you want. So the size of the nets increase, and that puts a lot more pressure on fish, even though they're being deployed. This is a seine boat, you know, uh, per saner, deployed from a schooner, and the seine boat's being rowed, and the dory is used to encircle the school of fish. But the seines are getting much bigger. Number two, new species are being targeted. We hear this vibe all the time. We should turn our attention to underutilized species. Look to jellyfish. Menhaden had never been fished commercially. Lobster had never been fished commercially. Juvenile herring or sardines were renamed and put into cans. Swordfish had never been fished commercially. Halibut, bluefin tuna, also known as horse mackerel. None of those things were fished commercially in the colonial period. In the colonial period, they caught codfish and mackerel. And they put them in barrels with salt or brine, and they sent them away and got money. If you caught some lobsters, you brought them home. But there was no way to market lobsters. Nobody was interested in bluefin tuna. I mean, some guy from the Azores might feed that to his dog. But no self-respecting Yankee is going to eat some fish like a bluefin tuna. So these things just weren't. They were just ignored. 1850s and 60s begin to target some of those species with ripple effects down the ecosystem. New means of marking, delivering more seafood to consumers. We, you know, we have cans, we have railroads. Oh, what if we take some pond ice out to sea and then we could keep fish on ice longer? And so there's these innovations that ramp up pressure on coastal uh, marine resources. Oh, and then that shift where they went from tending hand lines over the rail of the schooner to then setting out long lines from a dory. So each guy, instead of tending four hooks, is now maybe tending 400 hooks. We need more bait. Let's dig up some clams. Let's put in some brush weirs and catch more inshore fish. Herring, alewife, scup, whatever, as they're coming in to the bays. If nature can't make enough fish, perhaps we'll make some more in the lab. The US government largest research and development project for about 50 years was taking taxpayer money. This goes from the 1870s until right before World War I. Taking taxpayer money and trying to help the productivity of the ocean. It was the largest single expenditure of federal research dollars in the country for about 50 years. They put gravid lobsters on trains from Maine and sent them to Seattle. They raised clams and oysters and tried to reseed beds. And the single largest initiative was, of course, not just raising um, some fish in, in tanks to put back into the system, um, uh, like alewives, salmon, but it was to actually reseed the Atlantic Ocean with, with cod. Vast project for the government getting observers on fishing boats as the doomed cod are being brought over the side in spawning season, the government observer is massaging the bellies of the females and squirting the row into one bucket where these eggs are floating around in cold salt water looking like little glass heads of pins. 
and then they're massaging the abdomens and the males and squeezing out the milt into another bucket. And then these buckets are sent to the labs in uh, Booth Bay or Woods Hole, and the fish are fertilized. And then when you get these little fingerling cod, and then they put them back out into the Atlantic Ocean, just like the fish and game truck comes to the river behind your house in the spring and dumps some trout in. Except it's not like the Ice and Glass River. My wife and I used to live on the Ice and Glass River in New Hampshire, and we'd watch the fish and game truck every year doing this, right? What's the Ice and Glass River? You can skip across it on a few rocks. This is the North Atlantic. Anyway, this went on for about 50 years. It was well known that nature was not making enough fish. But if nature can't solve the problem, we will step in and remedy the situation in labs like this. OK. Um, in Washington, the two head guys who ran the US Fish Commission, Spencer Baird on the left was also the head of the Smithsonian. He had the largest research and development uh, agenda budget in the country. And his pal, George Brown Good, they fully admitted by the 1870s that the cod population was in free fall, but they attributed the decline to the depletion of the bait fish. Okay. But the fishermen did not entirely agree. So what led this generation of guys to think, beginning the 1850s, that fish were declining and that overfishing might be part of the problem? Uh, part of the answer comes from a, a paper that our group published a while back, uh, modeling cod biomass using historical records. What we did is we, um, we had his great historical catch records from the 1850s from the New England fleet fishing out there on the Nova Scotian continent. So we have this map, you know, here's Cape Cod and Maine and Nova Scotia with the Nova Scotian shelf. The blue are the fishing banks, uh, the western banks, Bank of Row, et cetera. And then we have the modern North Atlantic Fisheries Organization management areas superimposed. Um, it turns out that the logbook data is really good. The guys showed every day where they were. So you can take a single boat like the Angler from 1853. They leave Beverly, Mass. They go across the Gulf of Maine, sounding and sample fishing, not catching anything. Then they fish hard on Bank Row. I mean, on Western Banks. And then they fish harder on Bank Row. This is half the summer, and then they go home. But if you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those, and you get grant money to organize data, you can end up making pretty pictures like this. <laughs> My friend Stephen Clayson made this, but just check it out. Was that fleet from the north shore of Boston, were they fishing George's Bank? Nope. Were they fishing the Gulf of Maine? Nope. Were they fishing the Gulf of St. Lawrence? Nope. Were they fishing the Grand Banks of Newfoundland? Nope. It was like a bus run back and forth from the north shore to the Nova Scotian banks. We learned a lot about how fishing fleets operate in the 19th century. Um, I can't get too sidetracked, but anyway, this is what we found out, very sobering. Uh, 1850s, right before the Civil War. Catch goes down dramatically in this decade, falls by almost 50%, from about 27,000 fish per boat per summer to about 14,000 fish per boat per summer. So if you just imagine you're a fisherman, you're trying to pay your bills, your catch falls by almost half in the space of a decade, you're facing some problems, okay? And if you really want to be depressed, uh, the statisticians of the group, not me, did a biomass estimate for the Nova Scotian shelf in this era, one and a quarter million metric tons. Here's the more recent numbers by the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. You got the idea. It's pretty grim. Anyway, okay, so the Americans are out there and they're watching the catches fall through the floor and what are they doing? How are they explaining it? We all have to, we have to make sense of this. Blame the foreigners. Come on. <laughs> I mean, if they had had Muslims out here fishing, I'm sure it would have been their fault. In this case, it was the French. The French were showing up with these square riggers. They had much more sophisticated technology. They were catching a lot of fish compared to the Americans on their relatively smaller schooners. But even so, skip on the Lodi, 1858. Fish very scarce today. The French bothers us much. They run their trawl. That's their long line. All around us, so they get most of the fish. But check this out. No dories. One yawl boat, the guys are still standing around them, rail fishing or over the rail, okay? The 1850s, late 50s is a pivotal time. They're gonna begin putting out dories and setting long lines, which is what the French are doing, to try to keep up. So beginning the 1850s, not up to the Civil War yet, cod catchers are plummeting and discussions are raging about the need for conservation of fish stocks. This is this great Fitzhugh Lane painting, a 10-pound island in Gloucester Harbor. It's just really cool. But if you look here at the dory and the Hampton boat, 
uh, designed down there in Hampton, New Hampshire. It, it's so, it's just, it's like a photograph, this wonderful painting. But if you look at the fish, haddock or cod under the cleaning table there, they're big damn fish. I mean, the whole thing is so perfect, it's like a photograph. But so you can say, let's look at a painting in the pre-photographic era to see what we got here. And what we have is day catches in Gloucester Harbor, you know, day boat fisheries here, right? Um, lots of big fish. Anyway, that's a little aside. Okay. Anybody recognize this boy? Pogey, Menhaden, you know, they're, they're Menhaden called moss bunkers or pogies. Or. I went out one night to do a talk for the Pew Trust about fishery stuff, and I was just going to talk about Menhaden. And as I was leaving my building, I bumped into one of my colleagues who does legal history, and she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm going to talk to Pew about Menhaden. She said, man-hating? Are you doing gender studies? <laughs> oh. She said, no, no, I don't do man-hating. This is men-hating. She said, what's a, what's a men-hating? Well, it's an oily little fish with too many bones, and they got big heads, and none of us would want to eat them. But it turns out they're possibly the most important fish in the sea. They do in the water column what oysters do on the bottom. They are filter feeders, and they swim through the ocean with their big mouths agape, filtering plankton, bacteria, detritus, stuff. They don't have any teeth. They won't take a baited hook. They, you can't fish for them with a line, because that's not how they function in the world. But they provide a very important function in terms of filtering the water and thus helping light come through and, and cleaning it up. They also then transform directly the, the plankton production from the sun, phytoplankton and, and zooplankton, into the tasty proteins and fats that other creatures like to eat. So you get these fish, and they are feeding tuna and whale and ospreys and eagles and sharks and halibut and the rest. Okay, So it's a very important fish. You guys know this place, Blue Hill. In 1850, the Menhaden Wars, it would rage up and down the coast, started in Blue Hill. This lady named Mrs. John Bartlett kept hens. I used to keep hens. Hens love protein. They just love it. Her husband and son were fishermen. They were cod or mackerel fishermen, but they had a little gill net for bait. And she would, sometimes they'd bring in Menhaden, which would swarm in the, in the spring there, in the summer, I mean, in, in the harbors. And this lady boiled up some menhaden on the beach and made this like fish slurry, you know, fish goop, which she fed to her hens, and they loved it. And the oil rose up to the top of the pot, which she poured off in bottles. And the thrifty housewife that she was, later that summer, she went to Boston on a schooner, and this oil merchant named Eben Phillips said, $11 a barrel. I'll give you $11 a barrel for this oil. So she went home and told her husband and son to go out there and get some more menhaden, and she'd boil them up on the beach and <laughs> send the oil to the westward. Okay, check this out. This is Blue Hill. In that area, people had been living for nearly a century. And they'd been going out in day boats and catching cod and bringing them back to the shore and gutting the cod and salting them and putting them in barrels and sending the barrels to the west and getting money. And they'd been going out in day boats and catching mackerel when the mackerel ran and bringing them ashore and gutting them, splitting them, and putting them in barrels with a brine solution and sending that to the west and getting money. And now some of their neighbors began to go out in little day boats and catch menhaden in these small gill nets that they'd made by hand. These are all rowboats and small sailboats. And catch these menhaden and cook them up on the beach to get the oil out and put the oil in barrels and send it off to the west to get money. And they, now townsmen and friends and neighbors went mental. And they started jumping up and down and screaming as if this was a cardinal sin. Now, I entered this drama <laughs> here, for instance, in 1852, the second year Mrs. Bartlett is cooking these lousy, slimy little fish on the beach. A whole bunch of 150 fishermen from Booth Bay write this petition. Taking menhaden fish by means of seines in our bays, rivers, and harbors is very destructive, and if persistent, we'll eventually destroy them or drive them from our coast. There are hundreds of these petitions in the Maine State Archives, and they're from a lot of pissed off fishermen in Booth Bay and Surrey and Sedgwick and Gouldsboro and all up and down the coast, okay? I don't know what's going on. I'm just a researcher. I'm in Augusta. I'm going through fisheries records in the state archives, and I find all this stuff, and I don't know what it means. But I'm compulsive, so I Xerox it all. <laughs> so I got this big thick. To and then later, my group figures out that in the very same year, out in the 1850s, out on the offshore banks, the catches are just falling, free falling. 
And then I later find out that it's that very same decade, the 1850s, where the fishermen are pestering their legislators, fewer mackerel, fewer cod. So now when some of the neighbors begin to catch the forage fish that are at the base of that food chain, a lot of other fishermen go nuts. Deer Isle fishermen, Surrey and Sedgwick, much to the disadvantage and detriment of the cod and mackerel fisheries. Then some guys from Hancock County said, chill out, no problem. We are strongly in favor of free trade and pogies. <laughs> Fears of a dearth of pogies are entirely hypothetical. But then the guys from Gouldsboro come back and say, but fearing the material injury of the cod fishing interests, can't we outlaw destruction of the Menhaden? These are all rowboats and little sailboats, all with little handmade nets. Okay, there is nothing industrial or large scale about this. It's like neighbor against neighbor. You know, he's catching mackerel, and you want to catch menhaden, and the guys are yelling at each other, okay? So obviously, people are hot. Later, took me a long time, later I figured out that many of the cod and mackerel fishermen were sort of at a tipping point. They realized in the 1850s that things were not the way they had always been, and they felt threatened by their neighbors taking forage fish out of the system. Oh. And then what happens? Industrialization comes calling in Maine. 1864, the first Manhattan oil factory. No, now it's not just a little rowboat, sailboat lady on the beach. No, now it's a real factory. Oh, let's get a steamer. First powerboat fishing, motorized fishing boat in America, 1870s in Rhode Island. Here it is, designed by the Hershoff brothers. <laughs> by 1877, there's 43 of these Manhattan steamers in Maine. Maine fishermen capitalize on a fact of nature. The Menhaden winter offshore, and then in the early spring, they close with the coast down by Virginia. And they start coming up the coast, past Virginia, and Maryland, and New Jersey, eating plankton along the way. And they come up around Cape Cod, eating plankton all the way. And they come into the Gulf of Maine by July, eating plankton all the way. And by July or August, they're sort of fat and sassy. So if you caught the same wretched fish off New Jersey two months earlier, it's sort of skinny. But if you catch that very same fish in Maine in August, it's fat, and you get twice as much oil. Herman Melville had pointed out in the very same decade that the whale had probably puffed his last puffed and spouted his last spout because we had chased him to the ends of the earth and so that whale fishery that was providing oil was on its way out. So now we shift from the biggest creatures in the sea to the smallest ones and Yankee ingenuity can get oil out of them. Disaster. 1879. No Menhaden north of Cape Cod. For six years there's no Menhaden. A thousand men are out of work. Factories are idle. The fleet of steamers is laid up. Huge capital is wasted. It turns out, as I started digging, and I looked into Menhaden catches up the whole coast now, starting down in Florida, Virginia. In the years previous to this, 1878, more Menhaden was taken out of the system, aggregate catch, than at any time in the next 60 years. But in the next 60 years, the boats got bigger, they got spotter aircraft to find the Menhaden, the technology arrayed against them got much more impressive. But in 1878, the year before the crash, more fish was taken out with these very simple steamers and sailboats, okay, than would be taken out at any time in the next 60 years. As I interpret it, the population took a hit, coupled human natural ecosystem, and the population of this fish staggered for some years. Pressure was reduced, the fish rebuilt somewhat, and was then fished again. But welcome to a new model for human interaction with coastal marine resources, one that would be repeated time and time again. Okay, we'll pick up the pace here a little bit. So here's the Monhegan fleet. This is sort of fun. Some of you have been out to Monhegan. There's the cod drying racks uh, on the shore. You can see all the size of the small inshore boats here in the 1860s. Okay, these are day boats, day boat fishery. Um, it turns out that one of the challenges of doing history when you go into the records and you find things like diaries or letters, you don't always know who's telling the truth. It turns out that sometimes people in the past lie. It's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's true. So if, if it's possible to assess what some people have said with sources that aren't subject to lying, you know, it's better. 
So it turns out that there's, these fishing logbooks are really quite um, accurate in terms of their data for the following reason. Um, each day is, is one entry, the date and the weather and stuff, but then you got each guy's name or initials and how many fish he caught. The men were paid by individual fish. So Fred is twice as good fisherman as I am, and at the end of the trip he comes in and you know, he's caught 50 fish and I've caught 25, he's gonna get paid twice as much as I am. But the catch gets sold from the boat to the merchant, not by the number of fish, but by the weight. So now we have actually the, the number of fish on each trip, and then we have the weight of fish on each trip. But then the skipper gets paid the bounty, the government encouragement money for the fish at the end of the season, not by the number of fish or not by the weight of the fish, but by the number of days at sea fishing. Okay? So there's no incentive to fudge the figures, and the fishermen actually want the skipper to record accurately how many they caught. So anyway, okay. So the data's pretty clean. We got all this m material. We linked towns and fishing banks. We found that Frenchman's Bay area guys fished in this region. Here's Frenchman's Bay. They fished off to the westward here, um, down towards the edge of Penobscot Bay. And um, the Frenchman's Bay data was quite good for this inshore fishery. So check out this slide. This is uh, catches of cod in Frenchman's Bay from March to November of 1861. Uh, Civil War's just breaking out. And you can see there's a peak goes up the high point of the summer and then tails down again, okay? 148,000 codfish caught in Frenchman's Bay in 1861. My friend Karen Alexander made this slide. I put this slide up <laughs> in Rockland about six or seven years ago at a fisheries symposium. And there was this gasp from the audience. And a woman stood up, a little younger than me, and introduced herself as Cindy Smith and said, I've been running the trawl survey for the state of Maine for more than 10 years, and there are no cod in Frenchman's Bay at all. And I said, well, in 1861, there were at least 148,000. <laughs> and two years later, some of the members of my team went with uh, me and Carl Safina, the TV ecologist guy and a fisherman on a boat, and we went out and we did a little fishing in Frenchman's Bay, spent a day out there going back to the exact sites where these guys had been fishing, and we had three commercial fishermen on board and a couple of us wannabe fishermen and we fished all day. We caught some sculpin, we caught a mackerel and we caught one little codfish about this long. Yeah. Okay, so, but in 1861, what we actually know is that 223 vessels averaging 45 tons working out of the Frenchman's Bay District caught 12 and a half thousand metric tons of cod. And this, remember, is the time in which they are already convinced that the fishery has gone to hell in a handbasket. This is the time in which they are sparring with their neighbors for taking forage fish out of the system because they're concerned it's already crumbling. This is the time that they're worried about fish for the future. And any fisherman today said, oh, you can get 12 and a half thousand metric tons of cod just out of Frenchman's Bay Area? Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's one customs district in the Gulf of Maine. There were 15 customs districts in the Gulf of Maine. Okay. So we did some calculations, our group, about how much cod is being landed, roughly 70,000 metric tons a year. 70,000 compared to more recent landings of five or three or nine. Yeah, okay, it's pretty bad right now, pretty bad. So it appears to us the fishery is flourishing, but contemporaries did not see it that way. They thought they were in deep trouble and they tried to save their cod. And I'll just go through some of these slides. These are some of the laws that are being introduced. Some get passed, some don't, but uh, conservationists propose an act to prevent anyone from long lining, you know, tub trawling as they called it. There's the, the tub trawl, the long line. Jotham Johnson of Freeport. And if there's not something done to prevent this wholesale destruction, Farewell to our fishery on the coast of Maine. 68, guys seeking to protect cod request the legislature to pass to prevent longline fishing in Frenchman's Bay. So the numbers generated by our analysis tell us one story that we're all prepared to hear, which is that there was a lot more fish back then. But that doesn't take into effect how the people at the time saw it as really a problem. And it turns out that there was a big pulse of conservation energy here in Maine, 1850s, 60s, and 70s, some in Nova Scotia as well. These discussions were the same from Massachusetts to Newfoundland, and I document this um, in my book. But at the same time, fishermen have to fish. 
This to me is the most chilling slide I'm gonna show you tonight. And in part, it's because about my backyard. It's Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's where I live. My wife and I live on the river. She's the director of a uh, sailing school ship that runs out of there. I've been, I'm quite familiar with the river, spent a lot of time on it. Fishermen are confronted by smaller catches, but they adopt new gear. They go from hand lining to long lining. They target new species. They begin to buy nets that are made by factories. They begin to catch the forage fish like the menhaden. Portsmouth Fisheries employ 10 vessels, that's schooners, with 40 small boats, like dories, and 100 men in the winter fisheries. It's estimated that over a million pounds of codfish have been laid at one wharf in Portsmouth during the past winter. Wow, 1870. In and about the harbor, there's now sunk 63 miles of long lines on which are hung 96,000 hooks. <laughs> wow. 50 years before, that fishery was guys hand lining over the rail, each guy tending two hooks, maybe four hooks at most. And now you've got 63 miles of long line saturating from the Navy shipyard out towards the Isles of Shoals. At the same time, there's pushback from the industrial interests like the Association of Oil and Guano Manufacturers who want to use Menhaden in those factories with those steamboats to produce um, commercial grade oil. And they're pushing back against conservationists. And in my book, I, delay some of the, I, I delineate some of these battles. And then we have the collapses. 1879, the Menhaden crashed. I told you about that one. 1886, mackerel crashed on the entire east coast of the US and Canada. And for the first time, Americans began to sail to Europe for fish. In 1889, right after Homer painted that painting I showed you, halibut were crashing in the western Atlantic. And Gloucester fishermen are sailing first to Greenland and then to Iceland to make their halibut trips. There's no more halibut on George's Bank. There's no more halibut in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There's no more halibut on the south coast of Newfoundland. They fished out the west coast of Greenland and now taking ice with them. They're going to Iceland to fish for halibut. Halibut is like the bison of the Atlantic Ocean. In the 1880s, as the bison would take from maybe 50 million to 30,000, the halibut were hit just as hard. And in the 1890s, the lobster landings became approximately 50% of what they'd been a decade before, and then the lobster crashed and didn't resume to that level till the 1950s. So what we have here is these serial crashes in the space of 15 years. And three of these four species were ones that had not been fished in the colonial period. All these fisheries are new. Mackerel was an old fishery. Menhaden fishery, brand new. Halibut fishery, brand new. Lobster fishery, brand new. Okay? They all began in mid-century. And within the space of two human generations, whacked. We'll just pass by that one. So by 1900, fishermen are regularly using technology of the sorts that their fathers and grandfathers had protested. And some of them are uneasy about it. They're uncomfortable about it. But they're still doing it because they're fishermen. There's also increasing recognition that just as people had changed the land, this had been that forest that John Smith and those guys had seen. So were they changing the sea? Now, back in the 1870s, Spencer Baird had argued for the restoration of our exhausted cod fisheries. It never happened. That's when he made that comment. Here's the cod fisheries through time. And then today, of course, they're down here. 1912. 1911, actually, a congressman from Massachusetts introduced legislation to the US Congress that would prohibit landing fish anywhere in the United States that had been caught by these newfangled machines called draggers or trawlers. This is the first one, the spray, 1906. Five years later, a Massachusetts congressman introduced legislation that would prohibit, make illegal, landing any fish caught by draggers. And you see this great painting here of the dory man looking at the machine that would change their lives. John Fitzgerald, he's the mayor of Boston. He's Jack Kennedy's grandfather. He testifies to Congress, and he says, I'm the mayor of the largest fishing port in the Western Hemisphere, and I'm adamantly opposed to this new technology because I've been across the ocean to, the, to Europe and watched what it did there in the North Sea, and I've talked to Belgian fishermen or French fishermen, English fishermen, and they said, oh, it's, it's pooched. It's, we're landing little, little halibut six inches long here. It's done. The entire Gloucester Board of Trade came and spoke out in favor of this bill. The Gloucester Board of Trade said, if we don't stop this thing in, in its tracks right now, it's going to kill the fisheries. So what we have is about 95% like of the fishing interests in the country 
including the mayor of Boston and the Gloucester Board of Trade and the independent fishermen from Portland and Boston, the rest, speaking out, saying, we don't want this new technology because it will wreck the fisheries. And they asked this Captain Thompson, fish 30 years or so, schooner uh, fishing, dory trawling, and then dragging a skipper on one of the first motor trawlers, steam trawlers. And they said, Captain Thompson, this is now the Congress. I'm one of the few persons in the world that's ever read all of this unpublished congressional testimony. <laughs> Captain Thompson, what do you think is going to happen if we go with this new technology? He said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. In seven or eight years, you won't have any fish. He was wrong, but not by much. It took 70 or 80 years, which ecologically speaking is about the same as seven or eight. And then, lo and behold, he was pretty much spot on. So what happened? Well, the Congress sent it out to a committee. Lo and behold, the committee sat on it. And then the New York Times ran this big spread in New York 1914, the summer of 1914, just a century ago. Extermination threatens American sea fishes. Cost to consumer has risen. Drastic regulation needed. It's a long time ago, guys. In spite of serious opposition, Congress never passed that law. Otter trawling became the new norm. And once it became the new norm, the guys in the industry realized that if I go out there in a dory, schooner, I'm screwed. You know, if I go out there with a trawler, I catch more fish. I got bills to pay. So by about 1925, otter trawling was the new normal. Radical new form of fishing, dragging nets across the bottom, destroying habitat, taking little baby fish that got renamed scrod. That's a cod that's been screwed, I think. <laughs> but think of this. It's a, it's a new species that hadn't existed before because in a hook fishery, the little baby fish don't take the hooks. The hooks are too big. The fish will come, they'll nibble around the bait, but they can't get caught. So they go off and they grow up and then they have sex and then at some point they get caught. But now in this new fish, uh, fishery with the nets, scoops up everything. Mother fish, father fish, baby fish, spent fish, breeding fish, you name it. Two slides to go. So what happened? This is the tragedy, my friends. We as Americans have been having the same discussion about these fisheries since the 1850s. That's 170 years. And here's what happened. For about the first half of that period, up until around 1920, it was the fishermen who said, we got a problem. And it was the US Bureau of Fisheries and the government scientists who said, no problem, fish harder, we'll solve the technology, we'll, we'll learn more about the fish, go for it. And then in the 1920s, 27 and 28, Woods Hole scientists did assessment of the year classes and they said, oh, oh, these little haddock, haddock stocks look bad, look bad. There aren't gonna be very many, the year classes are bad. So they suggested larger mesh. And by then, the fishermen, only 10 years before, had opposed to this new technology. The fishermen said, no, if we don't catch them, the Canadians will. So they fished on. So what happened is, by the 30s, the scientists are beginning to advocate for reducing the pressure on fish stocks. And the fishermen are for ramping up that pressure and saying it's all fine. The argument like that persisted well into the 80s. So my point is that the argument about there's plenty of fish, there's not enough fish, we've been having it for 170 years. In the meantime, the stocks of fish have been declining, the industry's been declining, it hasn't really been working out. But the tragedy is that the people saying each one of the scripts flipped <laughs> in the 20s. Okay. We had known. We had known. So, one slide to go here. You know, authors always like it when... Uh, People figure out what they're doing. It's hard to read one of these books. You know, most of my students think these are like doorstops or something. But when my book came out, it got reviewed in the uh, Washington Post, and I woke up and had this, this fantasy that all the members of Congress were there that morning with their coffee, reading this book review by Jonathan Yardley about my book, and that all the policies would change. Yeah. So Yardley, in his review, here's the last two lines. The first line, he quotes me, and then he has his line. This is what he, my line that he quoted. Ultimately, the scale of this story, this is from the epilogue of my book, ultimately the scale of this story, spanning centuries and stretching across the North Atlantic, reveals, as few other tales can, the tragic consequences of decision makers' unwillingness to steer a precautionary course in the face of environmental uncertainties. That's me. And then Yardley wrote, anyone who thinks that passage, or this book, is only about fish, is living in a fool's paradise. He got it. Thank you.
Yes, sir. I, I point out to, to my students that by the time King George II in 1760 was inaugurated or crowned as the new British king in New Hampshire as a province, there's 39,000 people in the entire province. Tiny, right? Tiny. 39,000 people in the entire province. What have these people and their descendants, their forebears done? They had cut down all the trees, making a clear cut. They had dammed up all the rivers. They had killed the whales, and they had killed the ox, and they had killed the sturgeon, and killed the salmon, and they put the plow to the field and watched the topsoil wash into the river. Holy smokes. They sound like eco-terrorists. Now, what about us? Well, there ain't 39,000 of us. Last I checked, between Maine and New Hampshire, it's about 2.6 million of us. And what do we all do? Well, we drive cars. And we drive cars on impervious surfaces that we pay for with our taxes. And we take airplane rides and we drink water out of plastic bottles. And sometimes we take hot showers and we use little cell phones and computers that are full of precious metals. And are we greenies? Oh, I got the bumper sticker on the Volvo that says, live simply that others may live. I'm a greenie. I care about shit. I'm just living. I'm a normal middle-aged college professor that takes airplane rides and drinks water and has a computer. So the fishermen, we say, what do they do? Well, in the... 18th century, they didn't kill as many fish because the technology was smaller and all the rest. But as time went on, technology gears up. They knew at times, this is the tragedy, they knew at times that the technologies that they were employing were not really wholesome. Just like I know that when I get on one of these airplanes or drink a bottle of water out of a plastic bottle, because I'm told I should stay hydrated. I get these messages from the society of so large that it's really important for me to be healthy and to be hydrated. So there's water's in a plastic bottle, so what am I going to do? So, so a lot of us are living just like these fishermen. We're living normally in our society, and we're doing things that are actually pernicious. And in the future, long after we're all dead, they're going to look back at us and they're going to say, they were the car people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think that... I do, and basically the society is getting... You know, more numerous and more demands put on things. And fishermen are conscious of what's going on, and they're conscious that they are culpable in some way of the problem, and they don't like it, but they're fishermen. And it's all they can do is fish. And they try to get their politicians and their scientists to help solve the problem, but in the meantime, they keep catching fish. Yeah. It's a problem. It's a problem. On that upbeat note, <laughs> thank you. You've been a great audience. If anybody would like to buy a book, I'll write something in it.